still have a couple minutes left. Okay. Well, the key is to. There you go. <laughs> That'll be my job. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Right on, brother. You okay to start a couple minutes early? Um, if you let me blow my nose. I absolutely will. You do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think so. If they're ready. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, please continue to uh, enjoy your lunch, but we're going to go ahead and resume the program because we've got a pretty exciting um, uh, case study to profile, and it regards a town here in North Dakota that came together to create a vibrant community hub, and I am uh, on the edge of my seat to learn whether that was a post office. Um, I'd, like, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Kim Conico, uh, Executive Director of the North Dakota Council of the Arts, to tell us more. That's a good sound. Good afternoon, everybody. How's that lunch? Good? Okay, they didn't get theirs, so we have to talk fast so that they can eat lunch. Um, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about the Matic Opera House, which is kind of um, a great example of reinvigorating the American West and through arts and culture and through a lot of uh, community grit and ingenuity. And it's not the only shining example in North Dakota. We actually have several. Um, and w I guess what I would say is, is that that's kind of a North Dakota trait. Uh, do good work, put your head down and do more good work. But I think one thing we're really fortunate here is, is that everybody shares ideas. So I think that when groups like this get their start and make their way forward, they can call on many, many other colleagues in the field across the state. Um, we're gonna look at the opportunity that presented itself uh, what was needed in terms of the connectivity of the community. Um, we're going to look at the community in particular. And then we've got a little laundry list of lessons learned and advice. And that's actually pretty important because I think that, again, we're going to try to share information with you and then hopefully you can take this back to your own communities and see what can get started there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Leland Hagen, who is on the end there, Rachel Markstad, who's in the middle. She would be in the middle, wouldn't she? Um, and then we have also Paul Beckstrom. So the three of them are going to discuss what the Matic Opera House Association is and how it came to be. Thank you, Kim. And she told us very specifically that she controls the mic but I don't see any uh, robots or anything, so she might be in trouble. But uh, first of all, I want to say we count it a real privilege to, to be in front of you and to tell those a little about Little Maddock, North Dakota. Um, you know, we were told about how big Morris was. Well, Maddock's a lot smaller than that. So uh, I'm going to get you to. I'll, uh, I'll be uh, behind. Yeah, you can just pass it from, it's a Shutterfly book, it'll give you a little bit more idea what we've done, and, and uh, as I realized as I was sitting here looking at <coughs> all you politicians out there, that um, it just reconfirmed that I would never make it in politics, but I would be a, it would be a lie if I didn't say I'm a little bit nervous sitting in front of you all. I'm just a little country boy from North Central North Dakota, but just for the record, Two-thirds of us up here graduated from NDSU, and we won't talk about the other guy. Um, <laughs> he went to that other place. Do you want to put a slide up? Not yet. Okay. Well, we could. <laughs> Does that make you feel better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was in school here in Fargo, I realized if I ever lived in a city, it would be Fargo. 
Uh, that was to get brownie points with the mayor, but it's true. And I just loved Fargo. But as I got older, I realized I loved Maddox more and more. Uh, I just loved the small town. And uh, um, Fargo got bigger and busier. And 13th Avenue, sorry, uh, just drives me crazy. But uh, sometimes we call Maddox just the little Mayberry of the North. And, and we, we love the little town. But as, as I've listened to these tremendous speakers this morning, as, as we gaze into the future, um, can Maddox survive the migration to the cities? Although we kind of got a different angle on that, didn't we? Can it survive the inevitable increase in size of, of farms? We don't know. But if Maddox does go down, I'll tell you one thing, it's gonna, we're going to go down fighting. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. So let's talk about Maddox and the Maddox Opera House. I, uh, I, I can just tell Kim over here just squirming that I'm going to never shut up, but because she saw all my notes and I, I timed it. It was nine minutes. <laughs> but I might add. Keep going. <laughs> I'm going to get my big stick out in a minute. Maddox has a history of, of public accomplishment, I guess, is how we kind of... Uh, and a volunteer spirit, and it has been from almost day one. Maddox was incorporated in 1901. This is a, the oldest picture we could find of the Maddox Opera House, um, which was built in 1905. Um, early on, in the early 1900s, the, Maddox built its own power plant, and this is a city of like 400 people. Uh, in the 50s, I was so proud, I was like eight years old, and Maddox was listed in the Reader's Digest as one of the two cities that had a public sewer system. <laughs> it sounds kind of dubious honor, but it, it shows the progressiveness of the thinkers in, in, in Maddox. The, in the early <coughs> mid-1910s, uh, Maddox fought hard, excuse me, part of that dinner coming up, to have one of the two Benson County agricultural schools in the state, one in Park River and one in Maddox, and it brought kids from all across the uh, multi-county basis. Interesting side fact of that is it took 89 votes at the county commissioners till Maddox finally got a majority. Um, in the early 60s, Lee worked on the street project to put in paving and curb and gutter. That doesn't sound like much to you people in Fargo. But just look at some towns where there isn't. Uh, a lot of small towns don't have curb and gutter and pavement. Uh, more recently, and then I'll move on, Kim, um, the city pooled its resources and built a community center, uh, uh, a business and technology center, and a large event center, uh, 100 by 300 feet, and, now, and then the Opera House Project. And this is in a town now of about 375. Those four, uh, four projects cost several million dollars, most of them paid by public monies. So let's talk about the Opera House a little bit. Uh, there's the old one. Uh, it was opened as a, a uh, uh, retail on the first floor, Opera House on the second. It's 50 by 90, a pretty solid brick structure. It was well built but it had kind of fallen into disrepair. The roof had leaked for about 10 years, 12 years after the hardware store in it closed down. Um, so there was a lot of people that wanted it to be just leveled. And so some of us got together and said, well, what can we do here? And uh, our first objective was to save the building. But in May of 2009, we got together and, and listened to, uh, watched a video put on by Prairie Public. And they featured 10 cities in North Dakota that had, had restored a building or tried to. And I don't remember, two, three of them had failed. But they drove a point home to us very hard. You can't fix up an old building for the sake of fixing up an old building. It's got to have a real purpose. So frankly, we struggled with that. We wanted to fix up the opera hall in the second floor. And by the way, we research opera houses, and nowadays you'd call it a community center, because uh, that's really what it was in the early 1900s. That vaudeville did come through, but they had graduations there. Even basketball was held up there. 
so, uh, and lots of things, dances and so on. So we, the women in town wanted a coffee shop. So in my brilliance, I ask, how many cups of coffee do you expect to serve in a day? Hmm. I said, 40? Oh, never. 25? Yep. You know, I, I'm not a fancy coffee drinker. I said, well, what's a cup of that stuff cost? Four bucks. Oh, we're going to run a coffee shop on $100 a day, huh? And of course, it, you'll, you'll hear the rest of that story. We wanted to move the library in because it was in a little niche uh, in the um, city hall. And we later on, we started talking about a restaurant. And then we, uh, we went on to fix up the upstairs. I think Lee's going to talk more about that. So uh, I forget what my next slide is. That's what we found when we started working on the main floor. <coughs> Pretty ugly. Uh, and the f first day we worked up there to try to stop some of the leaking on the roof, three of more prominent people in uh, Maddox came by and said, oh, what you guys doing? Oh, I was trying to stop the leaking up on the top roof. And they all said the same thing. What for? <laughs> and so like all of your communities, we all have what, what you've probably come to call cave people. Citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> and, and, and it's just true, it's, it's sadly true. So we took a look at the, uh, at the building, and as you can see, it was pretty tough. Uh, there's the warp floor from all the water, and there's the upstairs after we tore down the ceiling. Uh, Mo I think most people thought we were nuts. We probably were, because it was a pretty daunting task. I remember the very first meeting we had, I walked back into where we were meeting, and here was Rachel sitting at her desk, like the at her table. She was just totally overwhelmed by it. She had readily admitted she's a glass half full thinker. We got organized. We formed a nonprofit corporation. We chose uh, 10 to 12 board members, 12 I guess we ended up with at first. We took a look at the volunteer pool, and we have a big volunteer pool in Maddox, even though it's small. We looked at funding of donations and grants, uh, what the building could earn as a revenue stream, and we looked at fundraising activities. And like every project, we had a little luck, and you usually need it. And uh, about a year after we first worked on the roof, or had that uh, first meeting in uh, 2009, we got an anonymous $230,000 gift, and for a small town, that's a lot of money. Yes. So, so we, we made some initial repairs. We, uh, we hired an interior designer. We hired a kitchen and coffee bar designer, and we formed a construction company with the help of our, the guy that didn't go to NDSU. Um, <laughs> and, he set it up as a, uh, its own LLC as, as a, a construction company. And one of, the, one of the reasons was we couldn't get contractors because everything was so busy. Uh, I'm done. See? You did great. Um, talk a little bit about um, forming the construction company. So if we could actually switch over to that, Lee, if you would talk a little bit about that because I think that's pretty rare that you form your own construction company to do the work. We uh, have a lot of old retired guys in Maddox, including me. Uh, I moved back there about three years ago. I'm, I'm a re semi-retired attorney, and I go back to Maddox, went back to Maddox to hide from creditors. So, <laughs> so the form... The construction company, Lightning Construction Company, got started in actually 2016 when Here's we a picture of them. when we began the second. Yeah, we were in the parade. <laughs> That's a picture of our shop teacher there in front, Cliff Simic, who was an icon in Maddox. All of us old guys took shop from him, and we all agree that if he were still teaching shop today, he would have committed something just about every day that would require him to be fired. <laughs> But we adored him, and he was a good teacher. Um, we, um, we were uh, f uh, forming this company because we were the contractor to do the carpentry on the second floor 
under the USDA loan and grant. Uh, uh, we had some pretty expert people. A couple of the guys were the longtime carpenters, uh, built houses not only in North Dakota but in California. Had uh, a couple of guys who could fix or invent anything. Uh, Byron was the uh, electrician, plumber, electronics expert, etc. Said he learned everything because of his poverty. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of fun working on it together. Uh, when we got to the second floor, we're kind of skipping around here a little bit, I guess, but uh, we did all of, the con uh, all of the carpentry on the second floor. We hired uh, contractors to do the, uh, the HVAC work, the, uh, uh, the electrical work, and the plumbing work, of course. We did all of the rest of it. We used to tell people we had a couple of requirements to be on the lightning construction crew. One is that you had to be between 70 and 80 years old. <laughs> and the other is that we had mandatory drug testing and you had to test positive or some sort of drug or anything. <laughs> Nobody ever failed. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that our companion organization was Thunder Paint and Lightning <laughs> Paint and Trim. Headed up by Rachel, <laughs> who not only sings and plays the piano wonderfully, but is also good at painting. And we had a lot of ladies that did all of the painting upstairs, so we gave them that name. That's how we came about. All right, Rachel, why don't you talk a little bit about the events when you started to do events in the Opera House? Our, well, sli our slides aren't quite in order. You'll have to apologize. So if you don't like it, you can let us go eat dinner. <laughs> Originally, we hadn't planned to do any events in the Opera House until it was completed and beautiful. But I think it was actually Lee that suggested we have a rustic version of some kind of show in the summer of, or the fall of 2011. And he happens to know Merrill Pepcorn, so Merrill Pepcorn <laughs> brought his show <laughs> to the Opera House. And I believe our stairway was not quite completed, so we had to bring him up the fire <laughs> escape to get in. And I, I believe he had some comment, some snarky comment about that. But we had a great time, and uh, opposite from what we were afraid happening, and we were afraid people weren't going to be because it was not finished, it wasn't pretty, I think we had close to 300 people. And many of the people who attended were people who grew up in Maddock and had never been up in the Opera House because it had been closed so many, so many years. So that was our, that was our big opening, even though it was more than rustic. Uh, it was, it was kind of scary, but Why it was Why don't you tell them about your nightmares? Yes, I tend to be the worry wart on our board, and I was convinced the floor was going to collapse. <laughs> um, but it didn't, and it hasn't. Since so, I guess it was as uh, secure as the as the boys thought it was. So it was a great time. Since then, and even before the opera house uh, started started having a few uh, events upstairs after its completion, we did have fundraisers to help fund this project at other locations. This particular location, this was at the opera house again before it was cooled and finished it was a, it was a september very hot production that we did and that was probably the first one that we did upstairs after the merrill pepcorn show we also did christmas shows in some of our other venues at the school and at the community center so that's how we started um kind of our oh, sponsoring events but not necessarily at the opera house there's a lot of uh, musical interest in Maddock um, at the school mm -hmm. and the church and so a lot of that work found its way into the Opera House for sure. Lee, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the funding you received? We uh, uh, began uh, with this real kickoff of the $230,000 anonymous donation as Paul indicated and we went to work right away on trying to find other funding uh, we did obtain a number of grants over the years. The first one was from the North Dakota Department of Commerce in uh, 2010 for uh, about $26,000 for, uh, for insulation and windows. Uh, it was uh, a grant that dealt with energy. Uh, we applied for a grant with the Bremer Foundation and were given $45,000 to fix up and equip the library. 
uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, we uh, uh, put together a kitchen. We knew that um, if we were going to succeed, we needed a restaurant. There was no, there was no other restaurant in Maddock at the time. And uh, there had always been restaurants. So a restaurant committee got together and raised about $160,000 in private donations from people, usually in the $5,000 range or so. Um, th we uh, then got a grant from uh, the USDA Rural Business Enterprise grant uh, for the kitchen. We got $62,000 for kitchen equipment and the coffee bar equipment. Uh, we needed an elevator if we were going to complete the second floor, which was our long-term goal. Uh, we were fortunate to fit into a timeline uh, and got a, a grant, which ultimately turned out to be about $80,000 from the North Dakota Department of Commerce uh, through its regional uh, office at North Central Planning in Devil's Lake. Uh, that enabled us to put a commercial elevator in on the fir uh, from the first floor to the second floor. So we had those things in place when we began the second floor in 2016. At that point, uh, we decided that the only way we could continue on with that project would be to uh, get a loan uh, to do the project. So we worked with the USDA <coughs> office, primarily out of, out of the Valley <coughs> City office. I might say that with all the contact we had with the Department of Commerce, the North Central Planning Commission, the USDA for the second floor grant and for the kitchen grant, we were really pleased and overwhelmed with the help we got from all of the staff of all of those units. There's a lot of bad things said about government, but you won't hear them from us. We were very pleased and we're very grateful for everything they did. They went out of their way. Just as a quick note, uh, when we contracted for the, all of the contractors for the second floor, which was, the loan was $226,000 and we, plus we got another 50,000 in a grant from the USDA. Uh, we had qualified contractors for uh, the major mechanical, HVAC, uh, electrical and uh, plumbing, uh, but we didn't have a carpentry contract. So that's when we formed Lightning Construction Company, LLC. Um, we had to provide a performance bond in order to get the bid. Well, Lightning Construction was penniless. The only thing we owned were some old saws and so on. <laughs> so uh, the USDA office in Bismarck, uh, rural development went to work and they found a way somehow through the red tape around the country to waive the performance bond so we could be the contractor for the, con for the construction. And we're eternally grateful for all of that. We spent about a year and a half uh, uh, doing all of the work uh, endlessly. Uh, we had a real regimen with the lightning construction. Ta coffee was at 10, lunch at exactly noon, and coffee again at 3. <laughs> The Bobcat Bar, which was part of the restaurant, was open at four, so there were times when, I guess about every day, when the, <laughs> the crew would stop in there for some refreshment. <laughs> I don't want to go into all those stories. <clears throat> in any event, uh, we, got, uh, we got all of that finished in 2017 and had a grand opening in the summer. Uh, in the meantime, we opened the coffee shop, the restaurant bar, and the uh, library in the summer of 2016. Um, and uh, I might say something about the coffee shop, which I think is really helpful to us. These are some of the ladies that operate it. We had the funding for the coffee bar, and people scoffed at that because it looked like a fancy thing for Maddox. But it's been absolutely essential. It was part of the, part of the grant and loan uh, program that we got from USDA. Uh, it, obviously, in a town of 400 people, you wouldn't find a Starbucks. And uh, you wouldn't find really many coffee shops that operate uh, with any kind of a profit unless it's a sole owner. Uh, but to operate this, we came up with the idea that we could form a limited liability company. Essentially, all of the people that own the limited liability company are partners. 
and so they're self-employed and they don't need to be paid a salary or wages. Uh, 20 uh, younger retired ladies all volunteered to man it. They're still doing it uh, every day from 2016 to the present from 7.30 a.m. 2013. 2013, I'm sorry. Uh, 2013, uh, every day from 7.30 a.m. till 4 o'clock on Monday through Friday, and then 7, uh, 7.30 a.m. until noon on, on, uh, on Saturday. It's been a boon for the, uh, for the whole operation because it's kept the building open every day for all of these years. Uh, they've had a wonderful time. And if they make a little profit at the end of the year, they get to split it up. I don't think it's much money, but it's, the coffee it's, is very good, and yes, the is. food is very good. And when I was there this summer, there was probably a stream of forty to fifty people coming in every hour. It's not a big, it's not a big city, and we sat there for probably about an hour and a half, and I'm just people coming in all the time. It was the central focal gathering place. I want to just add one thing about the uh, loan and grant. Uh, we started it with a loan of $226,900 in 2016. Our first payment, I think, was in 2017. We pay about $1,000 a month. But a month, And we, we came up with an idea that if we could get donations from people to reduce this debt, it might help. So we started what's called the Harriman Arts Fund. and. The minimum donation is $100 a year with a pledge for up to three years. We started that, I think, two or three years ago. With just that fund, we've been able to reduce the, uh, the loan principal starting in 2016 of 226900 down to the present amount of $165,000. So we're going to pay it a lot sooner than the 30-year term. I want to turn it over to Rachel. I just want to tell you one thing about her. Uh, everyone adores her. Uh, everyone believes that there isn't anyone in this state that can play the piano and sing as well as she can, and we have to force her to do it. But I understood from her husband, Dean, out on the farm, this might be hearsay, but I understand that in the summer when she plays the piano and sings, she has the windows open, and when she starts, all the birds stop singing, so they can listen to her. Aww. Great talk. Yeah, I'll pay you later, Lee. <laughs> Such a compliment. Holy. Um, I think this, these are all on your handout, but I'll just review them. Some of the things that we've learned and a little advice. Hire professionals. Um, <laughs> Except for carpentry. Except for carpentry. <laughs> Um, we, we did hire a designer and an architect to help us, and, and one of the funniest things, and, and we found to be such a true statement, was a fellow that, that was an worked for an architectural uh, company, or owns his architectural company in uh, Sioux Falls. And he said, when we visited with him, he said, um, you don't need to hire me, but you need to hire someone like me or you're going to want to kill each other if you try to do this as a local community group, and he was so true. It was nice to have those uh, people who had the knowledge of what's appropriate for the, for the uh, period of the building, what are, the, what are appropriate colors, what are appropriate window sizes, that kind of thing. That was great. So we would recommend that. Um, definitely create a formal 501c3 organization. Determine and emphasize the function of the building. Uh, we admit we kind of started out that we maybe didn't know exactly what we wanted to do with the Opera House. We knew we wanted to save it. But we found out as we determined what we needed and what we wanted that more people got on board and supported us when they, when they knew that we actually had a vision. Um, analyze funding and operation financing. Form committees and stay in close touch with your committees. We found that to be really vital. Have regular board meetings. Oh my, we met every week for a, a large portion of the time. Now I think we're maybe to two to three weeks in between. Now that we're up and operating, we're finding that we're, we have a whole new phase and a whole new set of circumstances to deal with. Um, screen board members, and by that we've found that 
not not everyone is board material in that they can get along and deal with each other. Getting along on this board was really important. We, in, we encountered some difficulties, but in general, um, we had to think long and hard before we approached people to be on our board, and that has made a big difference. The board must be a working board, and I can say that almost 90% of our people have not been afraid to roll up their sleeves and paint and tear down and everything that, all, that, that has gone along with this project. Rachel cleans the bathrooms. Yes. <laughs> Face up to disagreements and disputes and solve formally if necessary, and I don't think there would be a project anywhere, anytime that doesn't face that. But that's something else we've had to deal with. Prohibit individual actions. Sometimes when you have a large board like we do, people can go rogue and kind of want to do their own thing, and we've always tried to be careful about that so that everyone is in agreement and, and knows what's going on. Get a good treasure. That would be Paul Backstrom. So, I thought you said a good treasure. Yeah, we're working on that. We have that. Still we have Paul now, that. but we're still working on it. No, he's he's done a fabulous job. We've had so many accounts to keep track of, and so just he's just done a fantastic job. Um, this is important that we found. Be transparent with finances, all decisions and reasons, with all members and everyone, because of course the rumor mill runs wild in a small town, especially. So we have been we've been tried to be transparent as we possibly could be, and feel we've done a pretty good job with that. Keep it moving. Um, We've often said if you're, if you're not moving forward, you're not sitting still, you're really moving backward. So that's our challenge is to always keep trying to move forward. And what, are, what are we gonna, what do we wanna do next? What do we wanna be next? So that's, that's something that, that you need to think about. Avoid good enough and continually improve. Best of all, preach the joy of volunteering. Uh, the reward of helping others is not recognition and praise from others. It is the pleasure derived from doing good deeds, especially without recognition. And I think um, that's been one of the most enjoyable things for me and a lot of other people I've gotten to know through this project. And in summary, we've, reached, we've received over $700,000 in donations, over $300,000 in grants, and substantial income from events, gaming, and rent. Capital cost in the building is about one million three hundred thousand, and right now our only debt is one hundred sixty-five thousand to USDA. Income easily covers the monthly payment of about twelve hundred dollars per month. We have continuing needs, and we are planning solutions. So we we still have upcoming uh, hurdles. We realize that, but that's part of the process of growing. Over 30 people have served on our 11-person board over the 10 years since we started in 2009, and all but one or two have left gracefully and with thanks from all. <laughs> our present board is made up of about half mature folks and half young, talented, energetic, and enthusiastic people. And the, uh, the most important thing is that we all enjoy ourselves immensely. So. Thank you for inviting us. So just a couple of quick notes to close out. Um, I'm glad you brought up the young people who are serving on the board. When I did go up and we had our first meeting, uh, uh, there were two people with us at lunch who are t in their 20s. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Paul uh, and Lee have both told me that um, there is an eat crow sandwich on the menu at the restaurant for those few, few people in the community who were not involved. I could add in there, if you don't mind, Kim, that at one point we thought we should publish a list of all the people that had helped with donations and work, and we concluded that it would be endless, so we decided, well, we didn't decide. We thought that maybe what we should do, just do is uh, publish the names of those four or five people that didn't do anything. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> we didn't do it. Don't do it. Um, again, this is a, a really special project, and it was really looking at what the opportunity was and then rethinking that it wasn't just about saving the building. 
It was about what that building could mean in the community. It was ingenious, you know, to form the construction company, uh, to save money and to take care of the work on their own. And I think the fact that there is such a dedication to how this operation works in this community. Um, if I had to go to four board meetings a month, I might shoot myself. <laughs> But in this community, it works because they're constantly in communication about what needs to be done and thinking forward. So at this point, I want to take questions from you if you have any, and I'm sure these three able people can certainly respond. You can ask about anything related to the Maddock Opera House Association or how it got built. Anything? Yes. Oh. We're bringing a mic to you. Hi, this is Catherine Ferguson with the Aspen Institute. Thanks for your story. It's very impressive uh, to see what you've done and how resourceful you've been. Uh, I've been thinking about communities that don't have the resources that you do uh, and how in the world they get this type of project done because you did all kinds of things, including form an LLC and a construction company, things that seem really hard. So I'm interested to know, if you had to do it all again, like what would make it easier? You told us all of these hurdles you jumped through, but if, if you could have it done on your terms or in a different way, or if you didn't have an attorney and all the construction workers and a whole bunch of folks who had time and didn't need an income, uh, like what would you do? How would you make this easier so it would be more replicable in more places? I'm going to give you a minute to think because I want to bring up um, a town called Pekin. Pekin has a population of, Deb, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 89? I think it's it, it, small. They have an arts council. They have a summer camp for children. They're involved in a program called Art for Life, which deals with seniors. So what they did was they formed a county arts council and then drew from every tiny community around them to make it work. And they came up with solutions similar to what Maddox did. Do you have any ideas about what you would do differently or what would make it easier? Well, you've all heard of the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the people do 20% of the work and vice versa. And we've jokingly said, but it's kind of serious, the 20% of Maddox getting older and tired. But it's really neat to um, be encouraged by what we heard this morning about the youth. Uh, most of our board just met with Randy hudson Beeler, who's the president of the Found Medora Foundation. And uh, somebody asked him about the millennials, and he said, you know, people say the youth aren't like they used to be. I, I say, you're right. They're better. And that was good to hear. Uh, what we do different, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, um, it, it, it was a, I, I, I guess I'd say this. I don't know if you guys agree with me. I think if we had known how much work it was, we'd have never done it. <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of like remodeling a house, you know, it just I, never ends. I, I would add something. I, I think we would, um, I think you would find in any other community, just like ours, there is a lot more talent out there than you think there mm -hmm. is. Now, I was the attorney that drew some of the documents, but I didn't spend endless hours on legal matters. You can hire lawyers to do those formal things. Uh, I did a lot of work with uh, with grants, but you can find people that can do grant work. Uh, it isn't rocket science, you just have to be really careful and do all of the detail work and so on. And there is some out there. I think you'd find that in any community there are some people, even in small towns, that have a whole lot more money than you think they have. And some of them are very generous if it's for the right thing. You'll also find, I think, in any community that there are people that like to volunteer. And I think one thing, too, about all of the performances that uh, Rachel has headed up over these last eight, nine years, uh, one of the things she's found and we've all found is that there is a lot more talent in the small community than you think there is. People love to perform. 
they, they like to act, they like to get on a stage. Some of them are happy to make a fool of themselves. Uh, kids can sing. And when you put on local performances with local talent, all of the family members and friends have to come. So you sell tickets. It's a lot easier to make money that way than it is to bring in famous acts or expensive acts or musicians. You can do your own homegrown thing. And I, I don't think there's anything that we did that's really so out of the ordinary. I think we just uh, drew on what we have and I think every other community has. I've lived in many different places around the country and uh, Maddox is full of people that are similar to people everywhere. So I, I don't think you should say that this is something that we can't do. I think you can do it. And I would add one other thing. We would do it all over again, not because we didn't know what, how much work it would be, but we just had a ball. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> been really it fun. Uh, it's added years to our life. The only thing I can say is, well, I want to add just one thing about our lightning construction crew. When we finished laying the hardwood floor in 2017 in May, we put down 3,000 square feet of hardwood, and all these old people were trying to get down and up and down and up <laughs> and so on. But we made it. Um, and, but recently, we were talking one day. I happened to have the good fortune of being in good health and uh, have very few problems of, of any kind. But the other guys suffer. Uh, Byron Nelson needs a couple of new shoulders. By, uh, Gary, Gary Stodham needed, needs eyes and ears. Uh, <laughs> Erling Flighty needed a hip. Erling Carlsbratton needed a new knee. And they got together one day and they said, they're going to take me to a hospital and then they're going to use me for parts. <laughs> and I said, no. So. I think that in every community, no matter how small, the people are there. And a lot of it comes from really listening to what the needs are and really focusing on what the project or the building can do f within the community. I love that they were, that this community did so much in terms of fundraising and asking questions and really trying to focus resources so that things could be completed. Um, I also think that with the volunteers in this community, and I think you find this in others, it's really important to say thank you all the time. I think we forget and we have to be reminded of that, but it's critical to really say thank you to the people who are working with us. But this is only one example of what exists in North Dakota. This afternoon at the, um, there's a panel on culture and we're gonna look at a little bit at New Rockford, which is another small community that has absolutely um, taken off and is really shining on a national level in terms of tourism. Again, this was a great experience. I've been in my position at the Arts Council for about a year and a half when I went up to Maddox and I walked out of the building, I walked out of our lunch meeting, I'd been on a tour and I was like, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized how true and how possible it is, especially in a state like North Dakota and reimagining what we have and what we can build on. So thank you all.